Hey everyone, it's Jonathan, and welcome to the first episode of a series I've wanted to do for a long time, every version ever of Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows. This was actually planned to be the first episode back at the beginning of this year. We literally recorded this one at the beginning of February. But stuff happened, I had other things ready first, I ended up doing a bunch more Peter Pan than I had planned, and this series kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. But even beyond this year, I've wanted to do The Wind in the Willows for ages. I think I've been talking about it with Sarah and a couple other people on and off for several years, but it never really fit into the schedule, so this year I made it a point to finally get to it. I originally wanted to start out with the version I grew up with, the traditionally animated British film from 1995. We had that on VHS growing up and my brothers and I watched that one to death. But then I was telling Nikki about doing this series and we decided we wanted to do a more ridiculous version by some of the people behind Monty Python. But Nikki is not as familiar with this story as I am, so I thought maybe before we go on to something more out there, we should start out with a more traditional version and save that one for later. So I started looking for good ones and I found a stop motion animated version from 1983 from the now defunct British animation studio Cosgrove Hall. I'd never seen this one, but from the reviews I was seeing online, this was one of the best versions out there. And since it was apparently really good and done in stop motion, I figured this would also be one that Sarah would want to see. So the three of us got together to talk about it, and yeah, the reviews weren't wrong. This one is actually pretty great. So... You were not super familiar with Wind in the Willows. Um, no, I, I really didn't know a ton about it. Like, I remember watching the Disney cartoon as a kid. But uh, beyond that, my exposure to that has been very minimal. Like, you get little bits here and there, but by and large, beyond the basic story. And not that it's that in-depth of a story, but I, I wasn't oh, terribly familiar. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> when in the willows is life <laughs> no if you're if you're watching oh no i don't know what you watched but it wasn't enough because <laughs> i own the book and it is the the book i haven't finished it but the book is far deeper than any of the movie versions i've seen so far yeah, the the I I and I can see maybe in the one that we just watched, not this one, where they incorporated m a little bit more of the depth to it. But at the same, no, the the book, no, it's so precious, and they're they're oh man, I just can't even in <laughs> Wind in the Willows is life. Okay, there we go. That's cool. See, I was always more. Um... I can't even tell you what it was more of. Uh, I, my parents were just never, like, growing up, it was never a focal point. Like, I, I was always more Dr. Seuss and kind of in that realm. I love Dr. Seuss, too. And I don't even know, maybe it was just randomly gifted to me. I don't, I don't even remember now. I don't know when this started, but it is such a precious story. And it, it is cute. I, I mean, beyond, like, the depth of it, which you're not going to get from this. Oh, no, this, no, this, no. Version, this version is good, but you're not, yeah, you're not going to get all the, the same poetic depth that is infused into the book. So, okay. But this one is very charming, and it's a nice place to start or fall asleep to if you needed to be rocked to sleep by something sweet. <laughs> like, the beginning is very charming, and... Yeah, does not start out fast at no. all. So if you were um, at the end of a crummy day and you just wanted something to lull you off after a small cup of cocoa or something, this probably be a good place to to go. Well, and and these kind of stories, like, and I guess by modern standards, you really can't you can't judge this by any kind of modern standards. It is of the time that it was done and it's something that people are e easily forget about you know it's it is hard to sit down and take the time and just not even for this story specifically but just to breathe and to just be and the one thing that i got from this was and i know that this is this is a different thing but like they you know they sit down in front of a fire you know like when they're toasting bread they're just sitting there talking or spending the winter or the late winter early spring at uh, toad manor you know, you've got these very, I don't know, not relaxed, but very kind of just happy to just be and speak and talk and do that kind of stuff, people. And then you've got Toad that's just like bouncing off the walls. Yeah. 
in every age there are probably those people <laughs> oh yeah and it's funny because you could you can see a lot of people that just by nature of who they are like have that that just that insane energy but then with this you could either see it as like because of like you know the eccentricities that he has you know the the you know every new thing catches his eye is it a thing that he's young is it a thing that he's rich is it a thing that it's just in his personality it's There's his so many personality ways to go with it. yeah for sure because and you, you definitely could, get that later so because you could have somebody who's a lot less rich but who's still excited about what's the next new thing oh yeah. We, yeah and this version has him continuing on in that vein but in the book he actually matures and settles down at the end <laughs> <laughs> one of the things about this version that i noticed is how they put in tiny details that they really didn't have to do and maybe it was just because they were enjoying the process and it was art to them like the part where he leaves Mole End in the springtime and the paintbrush is there and you see the little drip come off of it or when uh, Toad is driving down the road and there's a random little ladybug. Like, they're, like, they didn't have to add in those little touches, but it was nice that they cared enough to do that, in my mind. Oh, no, absolutely. I would even say that the, um, like, the, the duck, like, when they're on the, the river where, um, where Ratty and Mole are just kind of rolling down the river. And you got the, the ducks kind of doing the the Esther Williams kind of show. Yeah, that was not that big part, a big, that was not a big part of the book. And they expanded it into its whole, <laughs> into this <laughs> whole thing. <laughs> Which I, I think could be relaxing. <laughs> Even the uh, the the animation work that went into that, like this was a labor of love, and that's not even a question. Jonathan bought a box set for me of this Aww. after we watched it, so that was a nice surprise gift. That is very cool. Because I I was like I don't know ten seconds in was already finding it very charming. She said something like, "We're not even a minute into this thing, and I already want to own it." <laughs> <laughs> And I knew it was long out of print, so I found a copy on eBay. Oh, cool. Well, did you see that this is actually... So the I was looking through the comments of, of this version specifically on, on YouTube, and um, it looked like the, it's Cosgrove Hall that did the original, um, mm -hmm. the original stuff. There's actually... I think it was a 52-episode set that was done with this or there something like that. There was a 52-episode television series that came after this plus another TV movie that was made in between the final season and the, like, third season? I don't remember if there was three or four seasons, but between the last two seasons, there was, a like, an hour-long television movie. What medium did they use to make this? Is it, like, mostly, like, little dolls, clay? What all were they using? Um, I don't think it's clay. I think it's... I, I, I know that the, at least with Ratty's head... It's not, it doesn't look clay because like the, like the fine detail on his fur doesn't ever move. So my I assumption like would be. I like rubber or silicone. That would make sense. I'm just looking here on their, um, on their wiki page. See if there's anything about it. Oh, they also did Danger Mouse. And it doesn't specifically say. I think there might be like, there's, there's more detail on my disc, but I haven't. I, maybe if I listened to that, I would find out. But we're not prepared for this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it is an interesting thing. And like, you know, you think like Ardman, and that's kind of where we where our thoughts go for generally when you're talking stop motion. But obviously it does go so far beyond that as far as what they do. I think Ardman is almost an outlier these days in that they still use clay because I think a lot of people... Well, nowadays they've switched more to 3D printing. Like, they'll print off all the pieces and then swap them out really quick in between shots. Yeah. But I think with this, I'm not sure what was inside them, but I think the outside was some kind of a rubber material. And probably right. cloth as well. Oh, definitely. I will say, though, and obviously this goes without saying, but the level of detail is amazing. Like, even down to their little claws on their fingers. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. I'm glad that he started you out with um, more true to the book comprehensive whatever <laughs> version because it sounded like you guys were going to watch one that was 
what more silly or out there or oh yeah uh, that's yeah. that's generally what i get brought in for is more the goofy <laughs> like uh because i think the one that we were going to watch is um the one that's like real life actors playing the different characters yeah i figured since you said you weren't too familiar i figured we should start with a more traditional one and then since I saw this was stop motion, I was like, well, Sarah will probably be interested in a stop motion one. Mm -hmm. So I figured this would be a good one for all of us to do. I wonder if it's just sometimes the temperament of people making stop motions. I don't know. There's something about stop motion where I usually like it. So how would you say that this one differs to the, um, like the Disney cartoon, just generally? Like you said that... Uh... Toad matured in other versions, and I can't remember. It's been ages since I saw the the Disney one, but uh, I don't know if I've seen the Disney cartoon, and if I have, it's probably been a really long time. We did. We did a podcast on it. We did. <laughs> yeah. We did. <laughs> the Adventures of Ichabod and Mister Toad. Okay. Well, it was very that... short. It was a much right. shorter version because it was only it... half of the movie. Okay. I mean, I remember it vaguely. I think maybe my We mind recorded that one several years ago. Okay, so. I think I remember the Ichabod more than the Mr. Toad. And if it's mainly focused on Mr. Toad, I like, yeah, that's really not the essence of... I should have brought the bloody book with me or something. I mean, I've got a copy right here if you want to look at it. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if you want me reading passages right now, but... Oh. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. See, when it came to the end, he wanted to show off and be all grand and everything. And he <laughs> he had written up a program and everything. And, and towards the end, it, it says, Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him. They saw through him. They had got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. Mayn't I sing them just one little song? He pleaded piteously. <laughs> no, not one little song, replied the rat firmly, though his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor, disappointed Toad. It's no good, Toady. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise and, and, well, and gross exaggeration and, and, and gas, put in the badger in his common way. <laughs> it's for your own good, Toady, went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later. And now seems a splendid time to begin, a sort of turning point in your career. Please don't think that saying all this doesn't hurt me more than it hurts you. And and he does end up uh, reining himself in and being more more humble and sensible. But, yeah. No, I'll keep that handy in case I want to read a deep part during this. <laughs> 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 but it's so charming. And and one of the lovely things about Wind in the Willows is that it's a seasonal book. It covers all of the seasons. And the story of Toad, while it's interwoven with Rat and Mole, is almost separate from Rat and Mole's story as well. And there are there's more than one chapter that could be read as its own short story. Even if you're not reading the whole book, like, I don't know how many times I have returned to the chapter Dolce Domum that's set in wintertime when Mole rediscovers his old home. Ah. And it's, oh, it's so charming. Anyway, <laughs> so springtime <laughs> and ducks a dabbling. And uh, this one is, okay, so when they're on the picnic at the beginning... And all of a sudden, these ruffians show up. That's not in the book, but I totally... It sets it up well. Because they're trying to stuff this whole story into this smaller time frame. And the Wildwood people are a problem because they're predators. And so that that worked out to, to make them a little bit bigger part there. And, and set the stage for why they're a problem. Right. And I imagine you think Weasel's, like, the only, <laughs> it sounds goofy, but the uh, the best, like, representation I have for Weasels is always uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and how they were, like, the, the robber villains, the kind of uh, fault, or not fall guys, but the henchmen for uh, Doctor Doom and such. The Weasels in Who Framed Roger Rabbit were the Weasels from The Wind in the Willows from The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Oh, interesting. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I think they did have they did have Badger show up briefly, yes. grumpily, which was in the book. 
Badger briefly appears. They, he kind of just mutters and leaves when they invite him to join them. And then that's when the weasels come in. I, th- I did have a question about when the weasels came in. Like, it's not in the books. But Ratty says that the weasels might seem all right in a way, but they're not to be trusted. And I'm like, really? All right in a way? <laughs> they don't seem that all right in a way to me. They made them extra thuggish in here. They were a lot uglier than other weasel versions that I've seen. They were really putting out the idea of this is danger, these are the bad guys. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you were to picture it as it would be in reality, they would be adorable little creatures, but who might eat you if you wandered into their <laughs> territory, which that's the realistic sense of that. I, I would imagine that they probably, like you think about the affable, affable, uh, like kind of ruffian kind of a thing. That's kind of the vibe I got off them when they first appeared. They're kind of like, well, you know, they're, they're, if you wanted to take them at that face value, if you were very naive, you would look at them and go, oh, well, <laughs> you know, they're from the wrong side of the tracks, but yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're generally okay. But then, you know, <laughs> as they kind of help um, Toad at one point and they pull out some good puns with the, you know, you must watch your back and while they're actually pickpocketing him of his watch. I like it's not in it's not in the book, but it helps set it up for when they take over Toad Hall. Yeah. So exactly. But they are kind of that, that you know, that lovable rep scallion kind of a thing at first glance, but then you spend any more time with them than that and you get the idea that they're very much not that not, you know, that kind of person. Now okay, so after the picnic scene, I suppose it's on to visiting Toad. Mm-hmm. And on the one hand, it could seem like an extra thing that they put in the cart, but really it's, when you think about it, it's so, or maybe when I think about it, it's like, okay, this really sets it up for his story because that is in the book and it's when he's introduced to motor cars and all of that trouble begins and it sets up, you know, how much he loves, he has his fads and and they did a they did a good job with that whole accident scene. <laughs> <laughs> I loved his, the expression on his face when they get crashed into by the car. <laughs> and I and it and it did a pretty good job of setting up Rat's character too. Not that they weren't already setting up his character, but the part about you know I don't talk about my old old river, but I think about it all the time. And and when he's yelling at the motorists, um, yeah. He's an interesting character in the book. I read somewhere that um, the four characters were kind of different personality traits of um, the author. Oh. Like each one of them represented him in a different aspect of his life. Like Like the things that he wanted to be. Yeah. And Toad. That's interesting because really I... I just, I love animal stories where they're little people and they show you what people are like, but in a charming way. (laughs) Uh, That that was actually a thing that I was, and I guess, like I said, I am very, like a lot of times when you see humans in an animal based world, it's not done where they're like one-on-one, like, you know, as far as size and, you know, the going back and forth and such. But I love the fact that you get that here. It's such a unique, like, it's something that I wouldn't have expected. Oh, what, what, like the animals being as big as the humans or something? Well, that and just the interactions of, you know, humans and animals kind of live in the same plane and everything. Most of the time, the ones I remember seeing, it was always like strictly animals or strictly humans. Mm. Like there's no need to explain it. It just, it's just a thing that is. In the book, are the animals human sized? Um, they, they kind of would, they would have had to have been because if he's getting disguised as a washerwoman. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I guess in my head, I've always just imagined that they were tiny, but you're right. Why would, like how could he be disguised they're, as they're a washerwoman if he was... And there, there's an avoidance of the human world, but yet there's also an intermingling of the human world because he does go to an establishment. That's a whole other thing. Of, I'll, I'll get to that because they did it differently with the, the thieving of the motor car scene mm-hmm. in in the book versus in this version. But yeah, you ha- you have the whole... His whole escapades with cars and smashes and... Um, like for a whole year. Because it, like, it, by the time he's done crashing cars, it's winter time. That makes sense because, yeah, I don't know when it when it starts. But yeah, it, that's that's pretty accurate to the to the book. And, and then with Mole, when he goes off to see Badger, in this version, does he try to tell Rat where he's going? 
they're talking about going to see Badger to see if he can get through to Toad, but then Ratty says that it's too late, they'll go tomorrow or something like that. And then he goes to sleep and then Mole decides to go out and find Badger by himself. Doesn't he say that he's going to go see him or something, or is that the other version that I'm muddling it with? Because here's the thing. In the book... <laughs> Mold just really wanted to go see Badger. He was not thinking about Toad. He just really wanted to go see Badger. And so it was kind of this little, maybe quiet rebellion of like, I'm going to go see Badger. And then Rat figures out later, oh, Mole is gone. What's going on here? And gets his, what is it, brace of pistols or whatever it says <laughs> in, in the book. Probably a cudgel. And yes. Yes. <laughs> he's he's prepared to defend himself and but yeah it's it's a little bit different in the the animated versions which you know it, it ties it together that way but and then this one i approve because i think they had snow right away didn't they yeah because by the time they started discussing toad it was already winter time i'd have to look in here to see whether it started snowing after he'd set off or whether it was already snowy but yeah, that whole thing of, of, of the little noises, because I think it, it does talk about whistling sounds. And, and in the book, it talks about weasels and stoats, which I think are slightly different from each other, but basically weasely creatures that took over Toad Hall and are probably the ones whistling to each, mm -hmm. <laughs> each other here. But uh, yeah, I've got to try and make sure that I, since we recently watched two versions, that I keep them, all, keep them straight in my <laughs> head. <laughs> Yeah, eventually Ratty wakes up and finds a note from Mole saying that he went to find Badger. So that's when he sets out to find him lost in the woods. They did a good job creating creepy atmosphere mm -hmm. for that. Especially with the noises and like having the little weasel puppets like peeking. Yeah, not in a cute way. Well, it's good to know what weasels could look like if they did actually kind of peek out of places. I don't think they would be as ugly, though, in real life. <laughs> I mean, they might be terrifying to a small creature, but yeah. Yeah. weasels are generally much cuter than these They're ones. They're so cute. That is true. These were very much like, they felt like something that Tex Avery would have would have like drawn inspiration oh, from. Oh, you know, I feel like if they had just been hand-drawn, they would fit right into a Looney Tunes cartoon. Oh, absolutely. Just well, they the do, shape they, you of know, the face. Very much, yeah. Like, they definitely took them in a more anthropomorphic anthropomorphized that's not right uh yeah no anthropomorphic <laughs> look yeah i love the part where well this part they don't have the whole argument between them over the the door scraper he does hurt himself on the door scraper but there's a part let's see yeah jonathan keeps collecting really cool books <laughs> he has a really <laughs> nice version of wind in the willows cool Oh, that is so... Oh, you know man. what you do? You say to him, hey, John. Hey, John. I really like this book. Uh, don't get it for me for Christmas, though, because, you know, <laughs> that would be far too much. And then John will get it to you for Christmas. No, I'd probably be like, hey, if you need an idea for Christmas. <laughs> also good. <laughs> I feel like this one I had to buy on eBay because I think it's out of print. Because <laughs> I wanted one that was in the same series as the Pinocchio version I bought last year. There's, it's such a small detail of this book, but I love I love when they visit Mr. Badger, and and this version does it differently. There was no talk of of cricket, and it's just one of the most charming chapters in the book. They're probably all charming, but there's this little bit right when they're coming that unless you have somebody narrating it, you're you're not going to get it in an animated version. And it says. They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping in the snow to keep their feet warm. At last they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside. It seemed, as the mole remarked to the rat, like someone walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him and down at heel, which was intelligent of mole, because that was exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then there's this, uh, there's this part in there where it talks about the suggestive uh, clink of plates or dishes or something as he's getting food for them. And then when he's putting them up for the night, how uh, describing his stores of food and how the, the bed linen smelled beautifully of lavender. And, oh, it's so charming. It's 
yeah, but you can't fully get that in this version, but it's still charming. And it's still a cozy time. And they, they in this one too, there's a whole morning scene that, that they didn't include, which is fine, but it's also charming where you have little hedgehogs that um, needed shelter from the snow that had fallen or something and, and Otter comes along and there's a whole breakfast scene and I could just, I could just go on and on, but they do talk about Toad, but there's, there's this explanation of how animals can't be expected to do anything strenuous in the winter and they'll take them in hand when the, when, you know, they're, they're more invigorated in the warmer in the warmer weather. But it's fine that they just got on with the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that in this version, they went to see him right away. I don't think they waited until spring. Mm -hmm. Which, they're talking like they need the weather to warm up, but like, you would think that Toad would be <laughs> unable to function in the winter, yet he's bouncing off the walls. That's, that. That's just due to his personality, and he has also quite a quite a lovely house so. and a wardrobe. <laughs> That's true. That's true. The whole outfit he wears throughout throughout is just it's so it's so very it, it fits so well. Yeah, he was supposed to be gaudy. <laughs> oh yeah, and back then, I mean, that would be the height of gaudy. <laughs> See, that, that type of person would probably be very fun to be friends with, you know? <laughs> so. Fun and probably frustrating. Right. <laughs> right. Stop trying to get yourself killed and stop wasting money. Stop stealing people's motor cars. <laughs> well, that was, that was another, yeah. Hmm. What, yeah, and I, I think you really enjoyed the scene where he was escaping from the house. <laughs> Which they 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 did a really good job with the whole um, him being rebuked, but then also like, okay, this isn't working. <laughs> like, I'm not sorry at all. It was glorious. <laughs> <laughs> um, which that is more of an extended them trying to to monitor him. Like they had set up a guard, and I think it was days before he finally um, tricked them, tricked Rat, and and escaped. But it's you know they did a good job of of getting the essence I th of of that situation i love the scene where he's like feigning illness and asking for a lawyer so he can write his will <laughs> <laughs> and then when they're talking about it him just appearing outside the window <laughs> which like like in the book rat and mole were out of the house and he had trick not rat mole mole and badger went out of the house and they tricked rat and then rat was getting kind of he was getting chided for falling for it whereas here everybody was basically falling for it and yeah it was it was sneakier but but they got on with the story and it was cute the way they did it i liked the couple that toad flags down <laughs> apparently named reggie and rosemary those are proper <laughs> british names <laughs> in the book I think he goes to an inn or something and I think he's going to get some food. Maybe he already had. And it's he's basically overcome with temptation. I think it's the slow creeping of... He, I don't know how much he set out to steal a car in the book. Whereas with this, he was... They, and it was funny the way they did it. And they're like, I have a flat crankshaft. And, you know... <laughs> 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 he, he was very... Yeah... In either in either story, he is brazen, <laughs> but very much. And I had to laugh in this one, especially when he when he gets behind the wheel of the car. Um, there's a I was telling John about this. There's a movie from the '60s called The Amazing Race, or sorry, The Great Race. Yeah. And it's got um, Jack Lemmon. He plays a couple of roles, and uh, one of them is this prince that's going to be made king, and he's just the most like the personality traits. Some of them, at least, are very much this character. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there laughing. The guy even, the, the one that voiced this, even sounds like him. It's just hilarious. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. I wonder if they took inspiration for this version. They very well might have. I That's a very, it's not, it was a very mainstream movie, but I, I, I don't know. I could see maybe, but it was, sometimes it's just, you know, happenstance more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But if you... 
ever get the chance to watch it, compare it to this, because like mannerisms, the way that they speak, the 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 enthusiasm, like everything down to the the tones are just right on. It's 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 pretty crazy. What was it called again? The Great Race. Okay. It would have come out in 1965. Mm mm. That was the year my mother was born. Very cool. And the Charlie Brown Christmas special. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's a it's an incredibly fun movie. It's like screwball comedy, um, mm-hmm. but it follows the not the tangent, but it, it's uh it kind of takes the story of the 1908 uh, New York to Paris motor race and makes you know takes some some liberties with it. But it's 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 quite a lot of fun. So interesting. Get out the popcorn. Man, I can about go for some popcorn right now. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) I think I was trying to get hungry. (laughs) I mean, I'm making meatloaf here. Uh... (laughs) Oh, I'm glad I can't smell it because that might, well, that would make me even more hungry. (laughs) Anyway, one other thing I liked about this scene was that Reggie keeps calling Toad a frog. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that just cracked me up. <laughs> this was this this is where it got like extra British with those accents and then yes. into the into the court Reggie. scene. And then into the court <laughs> scene with that judge, which is such a yeah. I don't know what accent that was in in the English roster if there's a name for it or not, but yeah, it got really I, I British would say really that's fast. probably that's probably like proper queen queen Elizabeth type British. Okay. Here's here's small I mean, if we're gonna spend two hours or whatever talking about a movie, I might as well bring up a tiny detail that is slightly irrelevant. Um so the whole scene where I like how they without giving him any doubt, because there isn't any, basically, but they're they're adding up all the years for what he's guilty for. In, in the book, they're talking about how for cheeking the the police, which was pretty bad cheek, they, they're, uh, they're actually, they don't actually tell you what any of the insults were. And then, so it adds up to 19 years. And I think she says, and one, one more for being green. But it, in the book, they said something like, oh, you better make it an even 20, something like that. So yeah, it was, it was slightly different. But I like in the in the book where they're talking about it. It was pretty bad cheek. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think isn't it in the in the in the our version of it? They 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 say it's because he calls um, the officer fat faced. Yeah, w- in the book you get the the which was pretty bad cheek. You get the impression that he had uh, insulted more than one police officer. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> I don't know. Like like he was just being totally. Yeah, it's like you've already had the gall to to take off with somebody's vehicle, and then you're gonna <laughs> disrespect the law. Not a good idea. And maybe it was a. Do you know who I am? You you know. <laughs> and then they did make it very dramatic in the book, which they 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 kind of they put that flavor in there of the the darkest, deepest dungeon in all of <laughs> Merry England or something. If that's their darkest, deepest one, they don't go very dark or deep. They, they, it was, it was so hammy in the book, the way they <laughs> described it. You know, they just really dramatized the crime and the punishment. And they had him come around a little bit faster in, and with less explanation in this. But it, yeah, it's one of those things where if you don't have a narrator to add in those details, but they did a good job with him and that. That girl who comes to help him. The jailer's daughter. Yes. Which in the book, he thinks that she's like fallen in love with him or something. <laughs> but, but she was just, um, you know, fond of animals and, and felt sorry for him and stuff. Well, in between all this, you also have Mole and Rat. Well, first they're out searching for him while he's in the middle of stealing the car. And that's when Mole gets the scent of his home on the breeze. Yeah, they did a good job stuffing that part in there, which I think in the book is more separate. Like they're not 
out searching for Toad that I remember. And that is the Dolce Domum chapter, which has all sorts of details and charm. And they don't actually talk about Toad at all, I don't think, in that chapter. <laughs> but they they manage to weave it all together so it's more cohesive story for the for the movie here. Where whereas Dolce Jones was really more about home and and Christmas time and but especially home. And the yeah. Yeah, it's oh man, it it's so cozy. Yeah, it becomes less about Toad after this point for them anyways, because they end up going back and finding Mole's home and basically moving in there. I think for the rest of the winter, they end up having Christmas there. And then that's where you get the scene with the carolers, which Sarah really liked. That was cute. Well, they were at Mole's home for that. Yeah. And and then they would have gone back to Rat's place. But they did, that's one of the things, they made it look like it was just Badger that had, that had tried to preserve Toad's home. And no, it was all three of them. And they were overpowered. Well, it's probably out of a different order because in this version, the carolers are the ones who told them that the weasels had taken over Toad. Or they told them that they'd been arrested, I think. Yeah. It might have been later yeah, that they which, found Yeah, which they didn't talk about in the book. But they, but like I said, they, it was like they wove it all together in a way that helped it make sense mm-hmm. for this. But yeah, that's at some point they move into Toad Hall to like take shifts watching the place until... The weasels come in and they basically made it look like badger had been murdered <laughs> they kind of did <laughs> which if you didn't know the story you'd be thinking okay this got grim <laughs> kind of like that alice where they killed off the mad hatter <laughs> anyway never forget <laughs> i like that they included okay so when she's helping toad escape <laughs> it's like you have a figure very like my like hers, the the washerwoman, and it's like I'm a very elegant figure for what I am. So does my aunt <laughs> for what she is. <laughs> <laughs> and that that scene with them is sweet because he you see a little bit of humility coming there, and it's I think fairly close to the the book. It's probably more tender than the book, but <laughs> but it's sweet. I liked. I don't know. Like, I don't know exactly what the thought process here was, but I liked the dialogue as Toad is leaving, and he passes the guard, and he says, Good night, Maud. Good night, old chap. <laughs> and he leaves. And there's, like, a beat. <laughs> old chap? Maud? <laughs> Stop him! <laughs> I, there's, they, they have not included this in either version, but when he's trying to get a ride at the train station, because <laughs> he, 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 I think in this one they do bring up, oh, you know, have, but you have kids waiting for you. Oh, any amount of them. But there's this great part in the book where he's all distressed and saying something like, and, and they'll be playing with matches. <laughs> I don't know. What <laughs> they should include that. I love that. <laughs> I yeah. suppose if you're if you're doing like a kid show back in like the mid '80s, you probably not didn't go the route of mentioning matches. Maybe I don't know. I don't know. And then somehow they had included the judge chasing after him too. I think <laughs> the, the judge and the people that he stole the car from because he passes them at the train station and he goes, "Isn't that the frog who stole my car?" <laughs> <laughs> Which, I don't think that's how it went, but they already had the puppets, you know, so they were probably handy to just stick in the <laughs> oh, absolutely the, the following train. I mean, it kind of goes back to, I, I think, a lot of um, English stuff out of this era. Like, it's 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 about the goofiness of trying to make the, the chase scene as, as goofy as possible. Like, you know, if you go to Benny Hill or any of that stuff, anytime there was a chase, you would get anyone and everyone that could possibly be involved in the chase <laughs> and i could see that doing with this too it's like oh well you know we probably should throw these guys in there too since they were part of the process uh, okay so they they did that and then i think pretty much right after that he was back at rat's house right yeah he, Where... he tells the the train driver his 
story and the train driver says he doesn't approve of motor cars but he also doesn't approve of being ordered around by the police so he slows down so that toad can jump off and he rolls down the side of a hill and he basically finds himself near rath's house in in the book that conductor was very helpful as well that or that in, engineer yeah was very helpful as well there is a whole there's a whole lot that like toad has all these adventures of trying to get back to toad hall in between that but it was fine that they truncated it and just got him back to rat's place there there leaves out the part where he's like haggling with a gypsy and <laughs> and his scary night in the woods um, and i think or maybe they included that. i don't think they included that. i don't know but yeah, all all the details. But it was fine that they that they got on with it, and they didn't have the part with Piper that there's a chapter that's kind of its own thing that they included in the the other one that we watched of Piper at the Gates of Dawn, where Otter's son is missing. But in this story, it's fine that they. I don't think Otter was in this version at all. No. Okay. Not that I remember. Okay. Yeah, whereas in the book, he's a recurring character. As well as the god Pan. Yeah, that is so... Oh yeah, so, I was wondering about that. Yeah, that is so... I don't fully understand why Pan is such a big thing <laughs> in the book. I may need to delve into what he was thinking there. It's interesting, but... Well, and the way I understand the, the background of the story was... Um, Graham, like, telling the story to his son and kind of how it grew and changed over time... Maybe he went through a time where he was into, and I can't remember if Pan is Greek or Roman mythology, but maybe there was something with Roman or Greek mythology. And so that's kind of what brought it in. I feel like people used to be far more familiar with the, with mythology than we are today. <laughs> like of of probably Greek and Roman. Maybe that's just me. I mean, I grew up with it. I, I, I was always like crazy interested in the stars and kind of the stories that related back from those. But I know I've got friends that whose kids are kind of into that same thing, but I think that I, I guess I, I can't comment one way or the other, <laughs> but it certainly wasn't through school that I found it. It was just on my own. Sure. I just, I I'm in my limited context. I think of reading poetry and how there just seemed to be, but that may have just been because I was reading this nerdy poet. I don't know. It was like, but it seemed like there was this knowledge base. Anyway. Well, I liked when he gets back to Raddy's house and they tell him about Toad Hall and how Badger was attacked. I think he thinks that Badger was killed. <laughs> well, they totally set it up that way. And yeah, he is acting that way. Because he starts crying. <laughs> and then Badger appears. <laughs> And he's not dead, of course. Well, he's Badger. He, You know, he's the kind of guy that can take a licking and keep on ticking. Oh, in this story, nobody dies. <laughs> so that's probably another thing that could help you read it over and over again. <laughs> you don't have to work your way through that unpleasantness. Understood. And then this is where they get the plan to take Toad Hall back. Badger tells him about the secret tunnel that he didn't know about because Toad's father told Badger and not Toad. That is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> that is very accurate. I, I loved the scene when they're making these plans and Toad is like looking out the window with the spyglass and they ask, how many sentries do you see? And he sees some ducks. He, says, he looks at them, four. <laughs> <laughs> Only four. That's probably not too far off uh, of his IQ in the, in the book. <laughs> Mo looked kind of cute in that washerwoman outfit. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah, Mo takes his washerwoman disguise and he goes to tell the weasels that there's an army of badgers, rats, and toads on their way that are going to attack them, which makes them post all their guards outside on the gates and walls so that they can sneak in through the tunnel. And, and then I'm assuming that the scene with Toad singing on the way, I'm guessing that must be a poem from the book because that mm -hmm. has made its way into mm -hmm. more than one version, but just with different tunes. I think, I don't know how much he, w if he was singing that at all in that chapter, but there's, 
basically before the party when he's not allowed to be obnoxious for company i think he's in his room and there's a section right here that says toad's last song last little song and it starts with the toad came home and goes on from there <laughs> so i think it's it's accurate to the book just in a different part of the story I don't, yeah, I, and he wasn't under the illusion, like in this version, you, he thinks that there's going to be more help coming. He was never under that illusion, but it works. It works for this version. I liked that scene where he, he talks to them like he's just assuming that there's reinforcements on their way. <laughs> no. <laughs> See, that's why you ask questions. You don't just, oh, well, clearly. <laughs> I don't think Toad asks any questions. He just no. goes along with whatever he feels in the moment. <laughs> Very true. Oh, one fun point about um, the Toad Hall is that it this particular version was based off of like um, like a, a how or a hall in um, Wexford uh, called Loftus Hall. Hmm. So we could actually visit Toad Hall if we wanted. You could. Well, actually, it's specifically the banqueting hall on the grand staircase. So, oh, okay. but if you wanted to compare it to see how accurate it is to that, then you could. I'm sorry. Is this a place that was modeled after the book, or a place that already exists, or? Oh, it's a place that exists. Um, but it was done like this specific version of the um, banqueting hall and the grand staircase was based off of this one in County Wexford in Ireland. So there's a real place that they took inspiration for this version. Exactly. Sorry, I wasn't clear. <laughs> for this animated version. Yes. Yes. Sweet. Thank you for bringing that knowledge base. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just something that came up on uh, Wikipedia. So it's like, ah, cool thing to mention. Yeah. Were you looking for a specific passage? I'll just carry on. I was, uh, I was trying to find the part where they're actually going to attack to see... Because I don't think he was obnoxious. Like, in this version, he was very obnoxious on the way to attack. And I don't think he was like that. Maybe slightly incompetent, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was not feeling super bold, I don't think. Yeah, he was just slightly... Okay. It was cold. Okay, so at last they were at in the secret passage, and the cutting out expedition had really begun. It was cold and dark and damp and low and narrow, and poor Toad began to shiver, partly from dread of what might be before him, partly because he was wet through. The lantern was far ahead, and he could not help lagging behind a little in the darkness. Then he heard the rat call out warningly, Come on, Toad! And a terror seized him of being left behind alone in the darkness, and he came on with such a rush that he upset the rat into the mole and the mole into the badger, and for a moment all was confusion. The badger thought they were being attacked from behind, and as there was no room to use a stick or a cutlass, drew a pistol and was on the point of putting a bullet into Toad <laughs> when he found <laughs> out what had really happened. He was very angry indeed and said, now, this time, that tiresome Toad shall be left behind, but Toad whimpered, and the other two promised that they would be answerable for his good conduct, and at last the badger was pacified, and the procession moved on. Only this time the rat brought up the rear with a firm grip on the shoulder of Toad. So, yeah, they have him singing all confident and and everything, but in the book, he, he, knew, <laughs> he, he knew that uh, there, he was in for a challenge ahead. But no, this is a good version. I, I think this was a good version for you to start with before you move on to any sort of crazy version <laughs> to get <laughs> to get the flavor of the story. Oh, absolutely. And honestly, uh, with any with any of the things I've done with John, I try to I do my research on the on the base story. But most of the time, sure. it's, you know, I, I take the the story where it is, like whatever the version is, it's like, OK, we're judging just this version, or at least my place has always been to just judge this version as we see it and then John or whoever is with us kind of provides the extra context of like the details of the original and how it differs which obviously both of you are incredibly good at and I very much appreciate that <laughs> oh thanks well I just I love this story so it's one of those things where it's like I, yeah hopefully it doesn't come off as endlessly nitpicking or anything because no, I, I like I them both that. And I've got to have something to say since I'm here to... <laughs> oh, no. Absolutely. 
I mean, I, you've, you've, you, you know, it's because it is important to see, you know, what it does right and what it doesn't do right, and and you know what details might be different but are still well executed for the way that they are approached. And I and I feel like with this one, while it's different, like I said, the way they wove it together to make it cohesive between the story of Rat and Mole and Toad, I yeah, I they did a good job. We didn't mention the end too, because after they take Toad Hall. They talk about how well Toad has been behaving, but then he flies overhead in an airplane. <laughs> Which makes sense as the next fad, and it makes sense if he had not reformed. But yeah, like I say in the book, he he decides to be a little more humble and mature. <laughs> Which an airplane would be fun, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, he ends up like, he drops out of frame and then you hear a splash, so... Yeah. He's not any more, or not any less reckless with the airplane than he was with the cars. <laughs> there were no airplanes in the book that I remember. <laughs> well, I'm sure if they're trying to create, like, the, keep the series going, like you, like you kind of talked yeah. about, it's, um, they probably had to keep kind of moving it forward a little bit. I guess take those, those um, liberties. Yeah, because if they were planning a, a series based on this movie and the book, you can't have Toad just be completely reformed and boring you gotta have him do something a little wild because that's that's toad i mean it could be doing very well and then all of a sudden he kind of side eyes the thing and he sees oh a motorcycle yay <laughs> Ooh, a jet boat yay did this book come out in like 1911 1912 according to wikipedia the the story came out in one form or another in 1908 but that could have been like maybe an initial version and then they kind of refor or you know refined it more as they went i'm looking i'm looking at the end here and he's like showing appreciation and giving compensation <laughs> to the people <laughs> along his adventure where he got home between the jailer's daughter and the engine driver and etc well like he the barge woman <laughs> which was not included in this version, which he did not want to compensate, but he was convinced <laughs> to compensate. One other fun thing about this version was it won a BAFTA and an International Emmy as well. Yeah, I can see why. This, oh, yeah. this won an, an Emmy? Yeah. Sweet. It looks like the film's music and songs were composed by Keith Ho Hope or Hopwood, late of Herman's Hermits and uh, Malcolm McDowell. But, or sorry, Malcolm Rowe, not Malcolm McDowell. I was going to say Malcolm that's McDowell. <laughs> that's, a, that's a completely different thing. <laughs> Your meatloaf's probably about done. Yeah, I've got it. It's kind of been going on and off. Uh, I put it in the crock pot and just kind of let it do its thing. Mm, okay. But you're right, it was probably closing in on getting finished up, so... I was just searching when the airplane was invented, but it was invented in 1903. Or that's when the first flight was. Right, was right, like, I w For a second I was wondering, like, is 1908 too early for there to have even been an airplane included in a story like this? But I guess not. But it makes sense for a car to be a fad and yes. be an obnoxious oh, new thing. So yeah, I guess we, we've, we've made it to the end. <laughs> Any final thoughts? Well, like you said, I think this is a good... You know, a good starting place if you're unfamiliar but want to get into the Wind in the Willows. And the, I mean, if nothing else, even if you aren't familiar with the story, just the, if you have any appreciation or any want to see some incredibly well done um, stop motion from that time. I mean, this is, it's, it, it's got so much detail and it's just, this was so lovingly done. You can see it in the way that it's laid out. Mm -hmm. How scary do you think the Wildwood scene would be to children? I'm a terrible person to ask. <laughs> it, it's probably the good level of scary, where it's a little bit creepy, but it's okay. I feel like this would be a good babysitting movie. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that, yeah. I mean, I I don't... I mean, there's definitely some creep to it, but this is kind of like a Scooby-Doo level kind of creep. Like, you know, clearly it's... Unless you're very, very, very young. You know, two or three. I think you'd be fine <laughs> with this. Good, good level of creep. I would say. I mean, there's that, you know, there's that thing that kind of puts you on the edge of your seat. Just, just enough, like an enjoyable kind of creep. Sure. It's kind of that, ex like that exciting, like oh my goodness, kind of a thing. 
And now you can move on to the odd live version, which I think <laughs> I only saw advertised if it's the one that I'm thinking of. I never watched it. But hopefully you really enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it. I- I'm always a fan of, even if it, even if it's, you know, not as accurate as it could be, I- I'm always a fan of weird and different, so. Sure. Yeah, me too. Well, until we get to that version, do you want to let people know where they can find you if they want more from you? Nikki? Uh, you can find me here on YouTube. Um, I am nowhere near Toad Hall, so uh, on any weasels listening in the audience, you will not find <laughs> me there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm at Trivial Theater. Um, I do a wide array of random, obscure, and straight-up bad movies. Okay. And Sarah? Red Bubble. <laughs> Turnip Wilson. <laughs> uh, I like to create whimsical art that and some of it would fit rather well with our Alice episodes, like from more than one, more than one would. But yeah, plant people, anthropom, uh, yeah, it's a whole variety. Yeah, with a random name. <laughs> but yes, Turnip Wilson on Redbubble. Okay, well, we will see you both in the future for more Wind in the Willows. So, Good talking then. with you. That's the same. <laughs> Thanks for listening to every version ever. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and follow my co-hosts as well. My link tree and all of our links will be in the description below. If you want more of my content, all my podcasts are available on YouTube as well as most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed this show, check out one of the other podcasts or check out my Patreon for bonus and extended episodes you won't find anywhere else. We'll be back soon with another brand new episode, so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.